Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. Witchcraft has been a means for oppressed people to maintain control over their own lives under oppressive regimes or, or you know, racist states or things like that. So I think that a lot of what we do is uh, giving people practical tools to take control of their own lives, especially as we sit here under the Trump regime. Uh, yeah, living in fascist Nazi America. We're definitely really radical people. I'm Luke Griffin, and you're listening to Bushwick a series that takes you into the extraordinary lives that people lead in one Brooklyn neighborhood as it explodes with arts, activism, and entrepreneurship. Today, you're going to meet the woman at the heart of one of Brooklyn's most radical and misunderstood communities. She's a witch who's helped transform one Bushwick shop from a bookstore into a catalyst for activism and the occasional occult ritual. This is Bushwick episode four, Catland. And a heads up before we jump in, there's some occasional strong language this episode, so be advised. The area surrounding Bushwick's Morgan Avenue subway stop is one of Brooklyn's most dynamic stretches. There are, of course, the bodegas and the shops, but also the baseball park, the police station, and the looming scaffolds of some of New York's largest new housing developments. In the middle of all this sits a store that's unlike any of its Bushwick neighbors, and really unlike any other shop in New York City. It's a bookstore called Catland. It used to be that when you walked by it, you might have to guess at what's inside. But these days, you can't miss the glowing neon pentagram or the sign that reads, Brooklyn's favorite little witch shop. And just beneath that, all are welcome. Inside, past a note warning that thieves will be hexed, you'll be hit with the smell of strong incense and the sight of an expansive selection of materials for practices that, unless you're intimately acquainted with the world of the occult, you likely haven't heard of. There are vials of holy water, but also of the more puzzling damnation water. There are candles that appear both ritualistic and decorative and something called the immortal rose of Jericho. There are shelves lined with idols that range from the Buddha to figures from Christian mysticism, And perhaps most appropriately of all for a store named Catland, there's also catnip. But Catland, ostensibly, is a place to buy books. And books fittingly take up most of the real estate in this densely packed railroad-style space. The literature here ranges from a biography about Einstein, to volumes about earth magic, to the most recent edition of a publication called Familiar's Quarterly, about the animals and other creatures that you might commune with, if that's your thing. When you're checking out, the cashier might need a minute because they're rehearsing the alchemical applications of the Enochian alphabet. Suffice it to say that stepping into Catland can feel at times like stepping into a different world. But here to welcome you into it with a warm smile and a studded denim jacket is Catland's co-owner, Melissa Madera. My name is Melissa Madera. I am one of the co-owners of Catland Books. Uh, I'm also one of our educators, our garden manager. Uh, What don't I do? (laughs) Melissa indeed has many roles here, but perhaps no role is more exciting than thinking of meaningful new ways to use Catland's large and unique space, which includes not just the retail storefront, but also rooms for private spiritual readings, an auditorium, 
and the secret outdoor garden where Melissa sat down to chat and where you'll hear some planes flying overhead. There's, there's sort of the shop space, which is where we do a, a lot of like interspa- interfaith uh, spiritual tools uh, shopping and that kind of thing. Uh, you can get anything you need for most different types of witchcraft. Um, there's certain things that we don't carry, but I, I feel like across the board we do a good job of making sure that everybody's really re- represented. Um, and then there's our event space where we do a lot of, you know, uh, community events and gatherings and parties and uh, even protests. But we, we mostly do education back there. Uh, and then there's the garden, which is as much like a um, place where we grow our own, like, herbal tools as it is uh, a place where, like, people can get uh, a little bit deeper and more hands-on level of education, uh, particularly in, like, herbalism and plant magic, which are my areas of interest. For all the functions you might expect from a place called an occult bookstore and a witch shop, Catland is increasingly becoming something much more, the nexus of one of Brooklyn's most radical communities. Since taking over Catland about three years ago, Melissa and her two co-owners have led an ambitious reinvention of what began as a primarily retail operation. Today, Catland is the home of a growing community of young people who are eager to use their collective power, mystical and otherwise, to serve justice in a world that feels increasingly oppressive. It's a surprising community that sees witchcraft and the occult as tools not just for the spiritual, but for the practical and the political. And it's a major evolution from where Catland and Melissa began their journeys not so long ago. It might be surprising to learn that, despite now being one of the most visible young figures in the New York occult community, Melissa grew up not going to seances and rituals, but to Catholic school. Beyond this Christian foundation, though, she found herself more powerfully pulled toward a more alternative approach to spirituality. I I, I wouldn't say I grew up super Christian. I grew up in a very, like, mystical household. My dad was not, like, outright witchy or spiritual. I mean, like, we had to go to church once in a while. But um, he was someone who would, like, take me out in nature. And he was very invested in storytelling and mythology, which is, like, a huge part of my practice and like the psychology involved in all of that and the things that happen to human minds when you tell stories that's a that's a foundational part of like most occult traditions and my mother was uh, first generation from Croatia so a lot of the folk practices from that area came over with her so I grew up in like kind of a witchy household but I don't think that anyone would have ever used those words it was only after finishing college and moving to New York that Melissa gravitated toward a more formal spiritual practice Like a lot of people, she felt a spiritual hunger as she navigated life as a young adult. But unlike a lot of people, she satisfied that hunger by diving deeper into the world of the occult and witchcraft. Uh, Living in New York is hard, and having a spiritual backbone to your life uh, helps a lot. Um, And so I started researching a little bit more, reading a little bit more, and of course getting involved in the New York occult community. Uh, It was just, you know, uh, falling down the rabbit hole, really, into things that were already familiar for me. Before long, the rabbit hole she'd fallen down started to become the spiritual center that she was looking for. So much so that when she found herself faced with a series of tragedies, the place she turned for help was one of her new occult spaces, a Bushwick-based project called the Tarot Society. I got a reading with someone named Molly Burkett, um, who uh, was a reader at Catland and said, you know, why don't you come by and see me sometime? And might help you sort out your life. Uh, my life was in absolute chaos at the time. Uh, yeah, I was a pastry chef at the time. I was, uh, my father was in the process of passing away. I was like in the process of leaving a relationship and I, I sort of needed some assistance. Melissa's tarot reader recommended that she visit the then new occult shop, Catland. When she eventually did, Melissa had a chance encounter with one of the shop's original owners, a playful kind of witch known as a chaos magician named Joe Peterson. So I came here one night, I think it was snowing, uh, and I walked like alone from my house and I was just, just sort of poking around the shop and Joe Peterson was there and he was just like, you know, do you need help with anything? Is there anything I can assist you with? I think I just started crying because <laughs> there was just so much. And uh, they just sat me down and they were just like, we're going to take care of you. It's going to be okay. Uh, and they ended up giving me like a lot of education and assistance that night. And I've, I've been here almost every single day since. <laughs> That night, Melissa found in Catland what her tarot reader had intended for the young witch, something she hadn't yet found in any of the city's other occult spaces, a home. I just happened to end up here and uh, was just really floored by the um, 
oh, what's the word? Like the level of care that they brought to the community aspect here, which I don't really see in a lot of the cult shops in New York. Uh, I see a lot of places where you can buy things retail or maybe you can attend an event, but nowhere that like fosters the level of community that we see here at Catland. It was a community that Melissa was eager for, a source of stability and strength at a time when her life was becoming increasingly unstable and hard. When she hungered for growth, it was Catland that provided her with endless new learning materials. And when she quit her job, it was Catland where she could spend her days among friends. After I quit my job in pastry, I took some time off from working and I used to just sit at Catland for eight hours a day knitting. Uh, and this is like one of my favorite parts of my life because I, I just really wasn't doing anything at all. I was just coming here and knitting all day and I was meeting these incredibly interesting people and reading these books and, and learning so much every single day um, and irritating the crap out of the previous owners. Oh my God, I'm sure they hated me. Uh, and they used to just like give me a book and be like, just read this and shut up. You know what I mean? <laughs> But uh, but it was fascinating, and um, I met some some incredible people in the community. Um, it was a very interesting time to sort of just be like watching everything unfold. Before long, Melissa became an investor in the shop, and in 2015, when the original owners wanted to sell the space, she joined with two partners to become a co-owner. Catland, the store, and the community had catalyzed Melissa's spiritual growth from a wayward young witch to one of the most ambitious, invisible members of New York's occult scene. And though she might not have known then, as she took the reins of one of the city's fastest-growing occult spaces, she was about to catalyze a new type of growth for the city's next generation of witches. Witchcraft and the occult have been around in one form or another for centuries. But more contemporary practices such as Wicca began to take hold in the West in the late 20th century. And in New York City, communities of what Melissa calls old school occultists have been active for decades. But starting in the 1990s, witches and the practice of the occult entered the American mainstream in earnest. In pop culture, characters like Sabrina the Teenage Witch and movies like the occult high school thriller The Craft introduced witches to a new generation, in particular, of young women. At the same time, there was what leading witch scholar and podcast host Pam Grossman calls a witch wave, a surge in real-world practitioners of witchcraft and occult traditions. When Melissa took over as co-owner of Catland, we were in the early stages of a new witch wave. But more so than the predominantly white and Eurocentric leanings of the last one, this new generation of witches would come from an incredible diversity of cultural and spiritual backgrounds. Now we're having a really serious witch wave again. And to me, that's sort of new school thought. And I feel like new school is a little bit more focused on like multiculturalism and making sure that like um, our traditions are honest and, and represent uh, everyone in the community. Uh, it's much more of a community feel than I think uh, previous generations have, have seen here. With this new spirit of inclusivity, Melissa saw the opportunity to turn Catland from a bookstore into something more a place that could embrace community and diversity, not just as compliments to a storefront, but as the pillars of an occult movement to affect positive change in the world, particularly in a neighborhood as diverse and vulnerable as Bushwick. Our big thing right now is like focusing very, very hard on making sure that like, especially because we're in a historically black and brown neighborhood, uh, to make sure that like those traditions are well represented here and well, well educated and things like that. When Catland first opened in 2013, Bushwick's transformation into Brooklyn's next hot neighborhood was accelerating dramatically. Some saw the appearance of a shop as counterculturally hip as an occult bookstore as another example of the neighborhood's gentrification. But as Melissa points out, Bushwick has a long and rich history of practicing alternative spiritualities. There were always witches in this neighborhood. There's been botanicas all over Bushwick since the, the predate Catland by decades. Botanicas in the occult world are spiritual supply shops for Caribbean and African traditions. They serve the specific spiritual needs of practices that are more common in predominantly Latinx and Black neighborhoods like Bushwick. Catland, by comparison, is a bit broader and perhaps a bit hipper. 
we offer a lot of the same things, but our scope is also much broader. So there's things you can get here that you can't get there, but there's also things you can get there that you can't get here. Like we don't carry a large amount of statues and things like that. And we also try to focus a lot on like local products, whereas I feel like Botanicas are very traditional and they carry like what people need and what people have always needed uh, and not try to focus so much on like local brands and like what's cool right now. You know, that's the kind of thing that we do. Melissa is acutely aware of what it means to be a white owner in a mod, a cult bookstore, in a neighborhood of color with a long-standing spiritual tradition. Which is why she made one of Catlin's primary responsibilities in the neighborhood, educating the broader occult community on how to practice the craft in a culturally competent way. Most often, that includes undoing the appropriation of traditionally non-white practices and clearing up misconceptions. We, we do a fair bit of education on, like appropriating native traditions because that is like so deeply misunderstood especially you know here in america it's been very trendy to like wave a smudge wand and you know that business it, like a sage that's the word people know yeah everyone's just like my house has bad vibes should i sage it and i just want to you know put my head through a wall um but that's my own business <laughs> it's clear just how seriously melissa takes this responsibility she sees her role in the process as more of a facilitator than a primary educator and she exclusively seeks out teachers and practitioners who can authentically speak to different traditions and connects them with an audience eager to check and dismantle its own privilege. With uh, Caribbean traditions, um, like black and brown traditions, uh, and native traditions in particular, just because like there's so many people in New York who can speak to that, and we still choose to listen to like white voices on that subject. So I'm trying to bring in people who like actually have like cultural backbone to their practice who grew up with this and grew up in a culture that practices this and like get those people to provide our education rather than someone who read a book about it there's a there's i hate to say this because it sounds so judgmental and nasty but there's a lot of fluff out there you know what i mean there's a lot of people who like um are in the spiritual world to make a buck uh or to feel powerful or or this or that you know what i mean and um not i mean like live your life you know what i mean but for us it's we're very very committed to um serious education here. It's a process that's been humbling, but has ultimately strengthened the coalition of ethical practitioners that Catland and Melissa now find themselves at the center of in this new witch wave. You have to build strong relationships because as a white woman, it's it's hard for me to be like, hey, I've got a cool, trendy occult shop in Brooklyn. Why don't you come talk and make me some money? You know what I mean? So it's a lot of uh, networking and a lot of like uh, humility and, and being humble around people. And yeah. One sensitive area where Melissa does step in as an educator is one that she's more personally familiar with, Christianity. She teaches workshops on how to translate some of mainstream Christianity's teachings into a more occult-friendly context. Christian mysticism and Christian occultism is, is something that's been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, yeah, it's a very fascinating subject for me, and I feel like for a lot of people in like the occult world, Christianity is a sore subject. And I don't think it needs to be that way. I think there's a lot of like useful things uh, that you can like pull from thing from uh, a very what is familiar for a lot of people. Um, yeah, I like. I think occultism begins at home. You know what I mean? I think that you, you can pull from what you grew up with and what you know. For all the proactive work Melissa and the Catland community must do to honor different traditions. Just as urgent is the need to reactively prevent other groups from co-opting more familiar traditions for less savory purposes. Sarah Lyons is a good friend of mine. She's a witch in residence at Vice. Um, and she recently published an article with them about how certain white nationalist groups have been co-opting Norse paganism. So that's things like um, Scandinavian traditions uh, to justify white nationalist rhetoric uh, and how like those circles have not not become polluted, but have become like a safe haven for white nationalists in certain places. Um, so, you know, we do keep an eye on that kind of thing. If the idea of witches as activists sounds a bit strange, Melissa is quick to remind that this is all very apropos for practitioners of the craft, which, she explains, has its earliest roots in resisting oppression in its many forms. If you want to get into uh, historical definitions, um, rather than being rooted in fiction, um, the word witch is rooted in patriarchy and racism. Uh, and it's very much rooted in uh, like people who are perceived as other and dangerous. As Melissa explains, the word witch, as we might now understand it, represents something of the reclamation of a term originally intended to separate people as others. Typically, the most vulnerable people, like women or people of color. 
It was a term that was ascribed to people who could heal themselves and heal, heal others in the community. People who would foster self-reliance in community, uh, in particular in communities that required reliance to the state or to social norms or things like that. Yeah, fostering self-reliance is, or, or fostering self-reliance throughout history has been a dangerous, dangerous thing. So I think that early witches were definitely people who like said, fuck the rules. And were usually like women, brown people, black people, um, other people, disabled people. For Melissa in the Catland community, this anti-oppressive spirit has never been more urgent than in today's fraught political environment. Witchcraft has been a means for oppressed people to maintain control over their own lives under oppressive regimes or, or you know, racist states or things like that. So I think that a lot of what we do is uh, giving people practical tools to take control of their own lives, especially as we sit here under the Trump regime. Uh, yeah, living in fascist Nazi America. We're definitely really radical people. In large part due to the anti-progressive politics overtaking much of the country, the Catland community is becoming more politically radical, and increasingly, a home not just for witches, but for all kinds of traditionally marginalized people seeking a space to organize against oppression. Now more than ever, not just our community, but like the New York occult community is uh, young, queer, and radical. That's, um, there's been a lot of like mobilization of like witchcraft as uh, political resistance right now. That's very, very big. It's a lot of um, like exploration of identity politics through spirituality, because uh, there's sort of been this big void. As people seek spaces to explore resistance and identity politics, Catland has emerged as part of a new class of local institutions, offering them a community in which to do so. I mean, I, I'm not even just seeing that in the occult world. That's, that's the whole advent of DIY spaces, you know what I mean? It's that the people want to get together and meet each other IRL, like, you know, in this like analog, non-digital way, um, and like actually get shit done and mobilize. Um, it's been incredible to be a part of that. And I think that uh, which is just another identity that's mobilizing right now. For Melissa, this is more than just an opportunity to resist oppression. It's a call to accept the central mantle of what it means to be a witch. I feel like witches who are not seeing this period right now as a call to action are, are really missing out uh, and are really sort of neglecting the foundations of what, what it means to claim this identity. As Melissa teaches it to the next generation of Bushwick witches, claiming that identity means accepting the responsibility to protect self-sovereignty and oppose oppression not just against witches or the occult, but against any vulnerable or marginalized people. At least for me, that's my perspective, is that uh, the role of a witch right now is to protect and maintain self-sovereignty under a regime that seeks to take it away from all of us. As you might imagine, the current president is a galvanizing force for the witches here in Bushwick and beyond. I know very few witches who uh, are in favor of the Trump state, uh, and I find those people to be very odd and misled. I don't understand them at all. I don't know how you can go through what we, like the, the spiritual training that we've all gone through and come out with that answer. It just boggles the fucking mind. But, uh, but that's their prerogative. You know, everyone's going to be wrong sometimes. And uh, I guess that was a nasty thing to say. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I would say that by and large, the occult community, uh, not just in New York, but everywhere, is, is going to err radical. But what exactly does occult resistance look like in today's politics? At Catland, it's at turns practical, and at others, more mystical. We were some of the first people, I think, in, in New York City to start holding like uh, public Trump hexes. It was an opportunity for us to really flex our muscles. The occult author Michael Hughes was the first person to publicly lead a large-scale spell of some kind on Trump and his administration. Among other things, it called for ingredients like an unflattering photo of Trump, a tiny stub of an orange candle, and optionally, some sulfur, to help prevent Trump from spreading hate or doing harm in the world. It was what's known in witchcraft as a binding. Catland, on the other hand, had something a bit more offensive in mind. Something known as a hex. A binding is more like, we want this person to stop doing bad shit. A hex is like, mm, we'd like you to experience some of the bad shit. And maybe that's just because we're mad. We're young and we're impulsive and we're mad. Um, but that's certainly, uh, especially as we like progress into like Trump era America, it's definitely a perspective that uh, I think is useful. As Melissa notes, Bushwick's occult community, like progressive communities around the country, is angry about oppression in general, and in particular, what they see as the emboldenment of one of witchcraft's oldest foes, the patriarchy. In October, 
Catlin made headlines by organizing another public hex, this time on the recently appointed Supreme Court judge, Brett Kavanaugh. Catland advertised the event as, quote, a public hex on Brett Kavanaugh and upon all rapists and the patriarchy at large, which emboldens, rewards, and protects them, end quote. It turned into a sensation, drawing international press coverage and interest from more than 10,000 potential attendees. But it also attracted death threats and mockery from the far right. Catland, however, has remained defiant, even staging a second Kavanaugh hex earlier this month. Noting in the description, quote, We will be embracing witchcraft's true roots as the magic of the poor, the downtrodden, and disenfranchised. And its history as often the only weapon, the only means of exacting justice, available to those of us who have been wronged by men just like him. End quote. While it remains to be seen just what effects these hexes might have on Trump, Kavanaugh, or the patriarchy, the true power of these rituals is around intention setting and creating a platform that activates more tangible changes in the world. In addition to things like public hexes, the Catlan community continues to engage in other forms of activism with more traditionally measurable consequences. I mean, we host um, like um, fundraisers for Planned Parenthood here all the time. We're also very close to the Satanic Temple. Uh, They're great friends of ours and they do uh, fundraisers for uh, abortion rights and for freedom of religion. They're doing a lot of political work uh, in in America and it just, they're just incredible. I love them so much. Those sweet, funky Satanists. Um, (laughs) But we've, we've done um, a bunch of fundraisers for uh, Standing Rock. We've done uh, environmental ones. We're going to be uh, this month doing a lot of things for obviously uh, children's concentration camps. God, that's a thing I have to fucking say now with my the mouth my mother gave me. Um, but yeah, no, that's where we are. For as passionate as Melissa may be about fighting oppression and seeking justice on anti-progressive figures, she never loses sight of the immense duty she sees as central to the witch identity, the duty to protect. At the very core of Catland's philosophy is responsibility and a focus on cultivating a community of ethical witches. Melissa doesn't mince words when describing just how much of Catland's education focuses on responsibility fucking all of it. Responsibility, um, like socially, spiritually, uh, environmentally is a huge part of what we do here. Uh, and it, it would be irresponsible, haha, to provide education without giving that sort of foundation for it. Telling people, you know, here's, you know, the, the historical basis for what you do and here's how to use it appropriately and, and in a way that doesn't, um, adversely affect other communities. Today, Catland primarily builds that foundation through its educational events, but it's beginning to invest in a larger footprint that may help to spread its radical, justice-oriented vision of witchcraft. Its first major project is a print publication called Venefica, a name picked from a Latin word used to refer to a poisoner and later a witch. And as you might have guessed, it's not your typical occult publication. Plenty of people publish things on, like, you know, how to analyze the tarot and how to you know like call down the moon or whatever and like i think in our last issue we had an article on like how to like occultize and weaponize your your queerness or your transness for like political action um yeah so like we're definitely taking a a more active and more um aggressively radical stance than other publications out there venefica is very much a project of melissa's passion a platform that has the potential to introduce Catland's unique combination of spirituality and political call to action to a bigger audience than would ever be possible here in Bushwick alone. It's been a mission that I've wanted to carry forward just because I really believe in print media. Uh, I believe in analog media. I believe in like distributing zines and things like that, like accessibility of like physical um, literature. Uh, That's why we're a bookstore first more Mm -hmm. than anything else. I really believe in books and I believe in like take home education and things like that. Um, Cause not everyone can come to meeting spaces and all that jazz, but everyone can order a book online. Um, so this is a, sort of the first step towards that. I think the larger picture is going to be uh, getting other people's scholarship out into the world, uh, publishing tarot decks and oracle decks, things like that. Um, really creating, you know, both tools and education that we can send to other people that aren't really uh, accessible otherwise, whether like online or through other means. Arguably, there's never been a time more ready for the kind of radical spirit at the heart of Catland. And certainly, 
there's never been a better time for witches like Melissa and her co-owners to raise their voices with a call to action. Whether that call is to dismantle oppression within occult practices, to create a new home for the marginalized, or to protect the sovereignty of, well, anyone, it's the people like Melissa, witch or otherwise, who are building the next generation of inclusive, transformative communities. And not so far removed from the wayward start of her own journey, Melissa is constantly reminded of just how important those communities can be. I'm just so happy to be able to talk about this kind of thing um, and to be given a platform to be able to do sort of the work that we do here. Uh, I'm really, really proud of the job we're doing here, not just because I'm like proud of myself, but like uh, mostly of the work that our community does. I mean, we really, we're three people who like have different practices, you know, sort of getting things together and selling candles, you know what I mean? We would be absolutely nowhere without the work that our community does to, to mobilize and to spread education and to cooperate with us to bring that all out into the world. Thank you so much for listening. Join us again in two weeks for episode five. I'd like to extend my sincere thanks to Melissa and the entire Catland team. They were really gracious hosts, and there were some super interesting parts of our discussion that didn't make it into today's episode, like a tour of Catland's secret garden. You can find out more about Catland for yourself at catlandbooks.com or visit in person for one of their upcoming events at 987 Flushing Avenue. If you're just joining us and you enjoyed this week's episode, you'll love episodes one through three. They cover other extraordinary journeys here in Bushwick, like that of episode two's Delara Urbe, who's pushed the boundaries of food on three continents and is now here in Bushwick to begin her most ambitious project yet. In the meantime, I'd love for you to join our community and follow us on Instagram, at Bushwick Podcast. Send us your thoughts and your Bushwick stories, either in the DMs or by emailing us at hello at herebushwick.com. That's H-E-A-R, bushwick.com. And if you have a moment, tell a friend or subscribe and rate us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Your support will help us share the incredible stories happening here in Bushwick, like Catlands, with even more people, and we can't thank you enough for that opportunity. Until next time.